This is Penn Woods. This is March 1971. We're on the college of the o on the campus of the Oklahoma College for Liberal Arts at Chickasha, Oklahoma, making interviews for the Oklahoma Living Legends. I'm visiting today with Miss Dana Dews. Miss Dews' grandfather was Dr. Daniel Johnston, J-O-H-N-S-T-O-N, who was an early day physician in Chickasha. He made the run of 1889 and went to Chickasha. He later or, came, or went to Kingfisher. He later moved to Chickasha and lived there until his death. Uh, we will be talking uh, generally about uh, this family. His, uh, now, uh, Miss Dew's mother and father, or Mr. and Mrs. Joe Dew's, were also pioneer residents of Chickasha. Uh, Mr. Johnston wrote a little history of his life, in particular of his experiences in the run, and later his experiences in and around Chickasha, and we'll be talking a little bit about that, possibly reading some from the diary and, and uh, talking about some of the family reminiscences. To begin with, uh, Miss Dews, I wonder if you would tell us a little bit, uh, to give us again your name, your, your, where you were born, where you went to school, your sisters, brothers, if any, that you have, and what their names are. We also have uh, Miss Dew's uh, sister sitting in with us on this, and she may be visiting with us a little on tape later. Uh, I am Dana Dews. I was born, born in Chickasha, Oklahoma, in 1917. I was the youngest of three children. My sister, Maud, is uh, four years older than I. We had a brother, Reese, R-E-E-S, who was uh, four years older than she. Uh, we were the children of Joe Dews, who came from Arkansas, and his story is a good one too when you get around to Arkansas, <laughs> and our mother, uh, Mount Holly, a uh, small town in lower Arkansas. His family had come from the East Coast uh, in the early 1800s. They came to uh, Alabama when the property began to run out in North Carolina and the East Coast. From Alabama, they went down the, to the Gulf and came up the Red River as uh, far as they could. Then they settled in this small town of Mount Holly. After the Civil War, uh, the uh, ground, of course, was worn out. They were poor and uh, he was looking for new property, so they came to Oklahoma bringing all of their stock and some of the timbers from their old homestead and the uh, cattle, the whole family and two other families came by train uh, by way of Fort Worth and up to Chickasha. And so that is where my mother and my father met. My mother was Blanche Irene Johnston, the only child of uh, Dr. Johnston, whom we are discussing and uh, his wife, Estella Reese, R-E-E-S. They had come uh, from Iowa to the south because he was tired of living in Iowa. It was very cold up there. He tells uh, in his diary, which we have edited some because he was an Irishman and inclined to exaggerate, but he made it amusing and interesting. <laughs> but uh, he was very tired of the cold and had studied medicine at um, I believe Keokuk, Iowa, as best we can tell, and uh, his stories of that are interesting too, of course, because studying medicine in those days was rather a wild business. Tell about that little summer thing. Well, I think the primary thing I can recall, he did go up to Michigan, to Ann Arbor, and study medicine there, and uh, he does tell about uh, the difficulty in finding bodies uh, for dissection and study. and. Uh, uh, that often in the basement of the building where he studied, uh, there would be a rap on the door in the night. Perhaps he was expecting it. He indicated so. And there would be some uh, individual with a body on a f oh, perhaps a, a flatbed wagon. He never asked where it came from. He simply paid a small fee, and thus he was able to obtain bodies for dissection. I'm sure it's an illegal practice and probably was then, but uh, that was the method by which they obtained them. Uh, but uh, he did study there until the money ran out. Then he went back to Iowa, and I think he realized by then he was not suited to uh, the form of farming uh, that was required. He detested the cold winters. So he came down to Purcell, uh, which was then a very small town. 
and a rather a rough town. He had an older brother who had come, and he encouraged him to come down. And he told him that a, that a uh, doctor could make a lot of money down there because there were lots of shootings, <laughs> and apparently there were. <laughs> uh, he, uh, he didn't have a gun when he came down because he hadn't felt any need for it. In Iowa, they were mostly uh, pioneer farmers. Uh, but in Purcell, his brother urged him to get a gun, so he did. And uh, he did, uh, in fact, later, when he was considering going into uh, to the Oklahoma run, he had to trade his gun for what he called a scabbard Winchester magazine gun. I don't know the type of that, but uh, uh, he decided that he wanted to see some new property after he had been in Purcell a time. And uh, you might be interested in what he purchased to take with him for the run. He left his family, consisting of our mother and, uh, and his wife, next door to a family who were pioneers in this area, the Spitzer family. You may have some information on them. But um, about April 1st of that year, 1889, he bought a tent, a cot, cooking utensils, a horse and saddle, the scabbard Winchester magazine gun, a hatchet and fishing tackle, a hunting knife and compass. He sounded me very well equipped, and he appeared to be. He had a slab of bacon, some buns, potatoes, rice, and canned stuff, and quote, as there was no store west for 200 miles except a United States canteen, 80 miles west of the Caddo Indian Reservation, west of where El Reno now stands. I don't know whether this would be uh, Darlington, perhaps. He didn't say. He bought a team of mules and a wagon, some lumber, an axe, a spade, two Winchesters. Also, uh, his older brother, Amasa, came along. They had tent, and he said everything they thought they'd need for a month of camping out. They had a fine white racehorse, and she could run and swim fast and long. They, uh, they spread out, they split up because obviously each one wanted a piece of land. And uh, Amasa uh, drove him up the Canadian River from Purcell to some place I thought suitable to cross the river and be in Oklahoma proper. Great excitement was rife. Now Amasa took mules because they were good swimmers. And they crossed. And of course, everyone had warned them about the quicksand. And uh, they were advised that if they got into trouble, turn the mules loose and let the wagon go, but keep moving yourself. We fixed a rope to the double trees and carried it into the wagon, so that if he got stuck, he could get the mules loose from the load and hang on to the rope. As it happened, that actually happened, and he had to be pulled ashore. They uh, were advised also to keep the fingers on the trigger, <laughs> because there were lots of what we term Sooners. Uh, they were approached by the military, who advised them that they'd better not step one foot over, they'd be Sooners legally and could be taken out because they would be illegal in that spot. Is this too much of what we would like to have? No, exactly. He terms uh, George Washington crossing on the Canadian as historical. We have tried to find where he crossed, but we haven't been able to. I think we'd have to go afoot and have someone who was Ill really there. Also, the soldiers called it whiskey crossing. We might find it that way. Uh, they said that was because they used to catch the bootleggers peddling liquor to the Indians. This, of course, being Indian territory, that was illegal. Uh, he pitched his tent and went to housekeeping. And that night, I listened to a great many different kinds of noise, one that had me up my, on my feet with a gun in my hand. It resembled the cry of a human being. I had read of panthers making such an outcry, and I heard it again at 4 o'clock in the morning, so I abandoned the idea of sleeping and got up and dressed. Then out at daylight, I got out and inspected all my luggage, and I saw something running up and down. They came up and smelled the stuff, and then they'd go down to the river and slide down to the bank and swim off, and then they'd come up again and smell the stuff. So finally, he realized there was a beaver colony there. And uh, he thought he was in real luck because he enjoyed watching the animals, the wild animals. And uh, he went down to the dam, found that it, uh, they had a small run of water about four feet across, then it would go out into the hill, out on a hill to the second river of the bank. The uh, spring was a nice large spring of fine clear water. They also had ashes, burnt sticks, and old bits of bones. Then he realized that what he was into was uh, an Indian burial ground. 
There were some poles of Indian houses still standing, plenty of feathers and bones, so it had to be recent. There were large bones and, and the skulls of buffalo, smaller game everywhere. The place looked romantic. This was a big Irishman telling this, and he was a big bluff man. And uh, he was rather gruff in his nature, but any time he wanted to go to the country, we tried to take him, even in his elder years. He lived to be 92 and was just as bright as could be and still liked to go out and look at the grain and tell us what grain it was, so he enjoyed this particular thing. I found old boats, moccasins, abandoned clothing, burnt out cob pipes, arrowheads, and broken bows and arrows. This was the border of the Arapaho Reservation. Whether this is true, I don't know. As I say, he'd make a good story when he got into it. There were lots of tracks of wild animals, some small deer and antelope. He watched the beavers. He thought they were trying to prepare a permanent home. So he made a slit in his tent where he could sit and watch them at work, mornings and evenings. They were the busiest beavers I had ever seen. And uh, he saw the beavers, and uh, he decided that perhaps he could entice them back up to the camp again by putting out something uh, that would make them curious. He, he, really, he thought they were curious. So they were. He set his saddle right out where he could watch it and yet bring them up closer. My reward came that same evening as I lay on my cot with my eyes glued to the opening. One old dog of a beaver quietly appeared, walking slowly, sniffing the air casually and advancing toward the saddle. He then sat up like a prairie dog, looking around in every direction, then approached the saddle. He smelled it all over, seemed to gain encouragement as the horse smell was so strong it hid the man smell. He licked it, I suppose for the salt. He tried to carry it off, but he couldn't budge it. He felt into the pockets, just like a woman, too, and then crawled under it. When he was satisfied there was no danger, he gave he stood up, gave a succession of grunts, and in five minutes the whole gang was there, fine, lovely, wide-eyed beavers. He enjoyed watching them for a day or two. Then, let's see, he, uh, oh, he gathered pecans. I'm not sure that would have been right in April, is <laughs> but that's what he said he did from a, some teaser around, and he kept hearing the loud yell in the night. He was concerned that it might be a, a, a cat of some type because he knew they were around. Uh, for his breakfast, he had fried potatoes and bacon, a cake of cornmeal baked in the ashes. And let's see, he started uh, trying to trace this large cat. He found the traces of coon, possum, and one large track. So I was on his trail. I wasn't really feeling at home without a dog. but. Uh, I found several trees that I could crawl up into if I needed to. So I spotted the area, and then I went back to the camp for the night. And in the middle of the night, he came up close to the tent and gave his war hoop. I got my gun out of the tent as quickly as possible, and there he was in the top of a cleared pecan tree. As soon as he saw me, he made a leap to the ground and meandered up a dark ravine toward the spring, and I followed him. But in the evening, he leaves out at times. He gets uh, sort of ahead of his story here, but he did go up on a high ridge and watch and waited, and he saw this uh, cat up in the uh, trees. At first, I thought it was a shepherd dog. He looked in every direction, started to go on, then stopped. And I realized it really was a whale of a cat as big as any dog. So I drew bead on him without much motion and fired. He fell to his knees and tried to get up, but failed. I knew how I had got him in the spine and paralyzed his hind legs. I mustered up the courage and got out my six gun and advanced on the enemy. He was brave as an old hunter. But I had diagnosed the case wrongly. I had on a pair of large overalls, and as I approached gun in hand, I didn't really want to shoot him again. I stepped too close, and he reached out a paw and hooked a, his claws into the leg of my overalls and opened his mouth for a bite. I fell over backwards and broke his hold on my leg, and then I got mad. I saw I had broken his back, and it had paralyzed him, so he couldn't get away. So I ran to my horse and got him up for the kill. But he didn't like it. He snorted and broke loose. I went over to the tent and got the rope and saddle and went back to the horse. I slipped the rope over the cat's head and gave a quick jerk and snared him good and tight. I pulled on the rope as tight as I could and tied it to a tree about 20 feet away. Then I saddled the horse and tied the rope to the end of the horn of the saddle and dragged him to the tent. By that time, the poor fellow was quite dead. My, he was a rank-smelling old specimen. <laughs> he smells so rank. I dragged him down to the river bank and skinned him. 
and he kept that skin with him for quite a long time. He slept on it, and I can imagine it was pretty awful. <laughs> we don't know, and we wish we did. I have a feeling he gave it away. He was great for giving away something, and he didn't. He was a man who didn't believe in keeping things with him. Uh, at the time that he died, uh, I thought it was admirable. He had a trunk, and it had everything he owned in it. He didn't have any need for anything else. He had this story of his, a few old things. He was a master mason and very proud of being a mason. He had his sword and his Prince Albert. He said a doctor should always be dignified. So when he came to Oklahoma, he brought his Prince Albert coat and his top hat. And uh, he kept those with him and used them. I am not certain of that. I would say not more than five or six years, certainly, right. before he made the run in 89. What, uh, what was in for at that time? What, did he ever describe himself? Yes, I believe so. It was a train stop, but was there any, uh, were, were there, uh... There were stores there, yes. Um, I would like to be sure of the year, but I'm not. I'll tell you a little about it if you would like that. And I was trying to find the year, but I don't find it. Well, that's all right. But uh, uh, on the, they, he came down on the train and uh, speaks of the train itself. The branches, he called it, well, was a heck of a road. It had old coaches, kerosene lamps, hand brakes, rough track, but no stops except at Oklahoma City. And at Oklahoma City, everybody kind of hunkered down, as he put it, and hid and kept their guns handy because they were afraid they might be robbed <laughs> at Oklahoma City. Uh, then during the afternoon, they began to enjoy the scenery north of Purcell. A flock of birds, ducks, and geese in every pond, and on the hills, antelope and jackrabbits, fine grass, and a million cattle on every hill. Passengers were all men, and they were delighted with the country as we rode on through the virgin territory. They all had six guns, a motley crowd, only two coaches, and a baggage car. This part of the territory resembled Dakota and western Iowa. There were companies of soldiers stationed about 50 miles apart all along the road. They had signal stations, which looked like an oil derrick, only taller, with a crow's nest on top. The country was infested with renegade Indians and cow thieves. He talked with the guards, and they said that uh, they found with Indians it was safer to shoot first, and the buzzards would do the rest. They were tough hombres. Occasionally they would see where a sooner had started a shiny and built a fence around it, but the soldiers or Indians had demolished all signs of civilization, a wild, romantic country, beautiful, warm, and sunny. The grass was green and there was foliage on all the trees. When we approached the Canadian River, the North Fork, and then to the mother of all bad rivers, the South Canadian, they began to see the remnants of, uh, of uh, team wagons that had fallen in the quicksand and never come out. I have seen this old man river roil down in four-foot rolls and cover everything within reach in one hour. I once saw it rise 12 feet in 10 hours. This is near Purcell. As the train came to a stop at Purcell, they, he saw what he considered a motley crowd, and uh, his brother, who had come from Iowa with him, said, look at that gang of men and look at their artillery, and it was a mob of soldiers coming to meet us. There were no white collars among these people, mostly flannel shirts open at the neck, trousers and spurs on high heel boots, each man wore a broad belt and a six-gun, mostly the 453, and broad Stetson hats, white and black. And that was the first thing they were scheduled to do, was to go and buy those, but he bought his Stetson hat and let the gun go till later. And I asked G.P. where his gun was, G.P. being his older brother, also a doctor who had gone to Purcell first. He wore an unbuttoned vest and belt with a shoulder scabbard under the left arm. He said the Arizona men carried it that way. They were all in a good humor and looked to me like a jolly set of big boys out on a rampage. <laughs> uh, he said, let's go back upstairs, and I didn't know what he meant. But then we went back up on what he termed the first bench back from the river, very steep and sandy, tramped down hard, and they call that the bench. The town is situated on quite a high hill, and the street running directly 
to, directly to the river was Main Street. About halfway up, we stopped at a good-looking hotel. And GP said, here we are, boys, this is my hotel. And uh, he gave over the management ship of this hotel to Amasa, the other brother. And he continued to be a hotel man and actually ran the first hotel in Chickasha in the very early days. Uh, we went and had supper, and the hotel was jammed full, and uh, Dr. Johnston said he went to bed about 3.30 in the morning, but he couldn't sleep because of all the noise outside, and finally uh, uh, Amazon came along with a couple of drunks and said, I need your bed, so <laughs> he turned his bed over to Amazon, and he got two dollars from each of them for the rest of the night. He, he uh, bedded down somewhere else. Then, uh, let me see. Uh, Oh, a bunch of toughs came along then, and a little bit earlier, a little later in the morning, and he finally got them bedded down. But the next day, he presented them with a big bill for what they destroyed and put his hand on his gun under his arm, and they paid up for what they had destroyed. He, I think, uh, too, the price of the Stetson hat was inflated. He said that they'd been selling these big white Stetson hats for about $10, but they were then selling for $25 because everybody felt he had to have one. So I guess this was the first of the big white hat crowd. The better element of Purcell got together and petitioned Washington for some help to handle the uh, unruly element. So in 10 days, there was a company of dragoons from Fort Sill camped outside town, and they remained there until the uh, opening uh, in 1889 in April. These were about as tough as the saltiest citizens in town, but they walked the town in squads and made arrests. They took some prisoners to Fort Sill for trial. There weren't many killings that winter after the soldiers came. Purcell was the only trading place south of Wichita, Kansas, and north of Gainesville. Uh, Gainesville also apparently had the only bank anyone trusted, because often he would accept payment on a piece of paper written out as a check from Gainesville, when he wouldn't take a piece of paper from on any other place. All the western tribes of Indians west of the 98th meridian came there to trade. We had four large buildings with stockades and camping places for all. The government paid the, the Indians grass money that the big cow companies paid for pasturage, so once a month all the Indians would come in to gamble and trade. One time I was at a convention. He states that it was the last convention, I'm not sure of that, of the five civilized tribes held out on a hill near Purcell. There were 3,700 of them, togged out in fine feather bonnets and gaudy blankets. They came to elect their chiefs for three years or until death. It was an inspiring sight. A friend and I were the only white men there. My friend was a friend of the chief of the Creeks, who was a fat old tubby, but he was very wise. He didn't mind if he insulted people once in a while. <laughs> he invited us to the convention, and I got to liking the old boy. They were a lousy bunch, literally, and a white man had to keep his eyes open while in touch with them. The chief's man was Silas Perryman, or Big Ear and I met Chief Bardenot of the Cherokees, and Towagane Jim, and Mr. Brown. T-O-W-A-G-O-N-I-E Jim, I don't know about his spelling, and one he terms Mr. Brown of the Seminoles. That was the last tribal convention ever held. I received my first license, this would be to practice medicine, from Governor Byrd of the Chickasaw Nation. The, J the Dawes Commission was given charge of all the Indian affairs after statehood. I made friends, acquaintances, and some enemies. Uh, there was a druggist there, and he introduced him to what he terms the best people in Purcell. There was a priest and the Catholic school. Did he ever have anything to say about the Dawes Commission? That's the only commentary that uh, I recall on that. Uh, his daughter attended the Catholic school because there were no other schools there. There was no sanitation, so we had typhoid fever as the water was bad and no sewage. Therefore, we kept busy all during the fall and winter, the doctors did. And uh, he said he got tired of being shunted from one restaurant to another and eating all kinds of food. So he bought a house from an Indian for $600, no title except the bill of sale. And uh, he had his family come down and sent his daughter Blanche, our mother, to the Catholic school. There were no churches, no banks, no laws, no schools, no bridges, and no roads. But there were plenty of horses and big cattle ranches and game up to the opening of Oklahoma proper. What part of his patients uh, were Indian and what, who were whites, and where did the whites come from at that time? Uh, 
he refers to cowboys particularly. Uh, many people came up from Texas. Um, because of the opening, people knew it was going to be open by then. Did you make the run from Texas? No, uh, from uh, the other side of the Canadian, as I understand it, uh, was his legal way to make it. Uh, the run itself, uh, he describes. I thought so, too. I don't know either, except that uh, he and his brothers uh, split up. And he had been up to Darlington and uh, liked the looks of it, I dare say. Um, he didn't really say that I recall why he decided to go there. I had wondered why he wouldn't have started on the other end. Mm -hmm. It, uh, it would be thought that he would go there, but uh, he planned to go to this place down uh, along the uh, river and go in from there, and he did. He rode uh, all day. Uh, if I might give you a little bit from the diary, on the run itself, uh, on the day at, the, at high noon was the proper time, and that's the only way they could tell everyone that it was high noon and time for the great Oklahoma public domain to be open for everyone over 21 years of age. It was estimated 100,000 people gathered for that opening around the borders. Uh, soldiers were stationed all, uh, every so far all around the border. At the crack of a pistol, these thousands made a dash. And uh, that morning early at his little campment, encampment on the river, about 45 umbries, as he termed them, hard-looking fellows, came down river to my camp. They rode mules and ponies. He tended to term people of Mexican blood umbries, so it could be people came up across that way. The leader told me they had been prospecting for gold in the Wichita Mountains and were going to make the run. The river looked bad as it was almost bank full and dangerous, and about 10 o'clock a bunch of cattle was driven out of Oklahoma. Everyone was supposed to be out, and of course they weren't. But he said it was lucky because the cattle settled the quicksand, and about 11.30 they had finished the crossing. I turned my watch ahead, so we were going to go by my time 30 minutes early. <laughs> I suspect there was a lot of that that day. As the last of the cattle came out of the water, someone said, let's go, and in we went. We swam for some hundred feet, then hit the sand, and there was cussing and yelling, spurring at ponies, and uh, slapping of mules. As we reached the quicksand, the animals knew it, and they did their damnedest to reach shore in solid footing, which we all did but one boy on a small pony. His pony was a poor swimmer and went under several times, with the boy yelling for help. As the pony reached the sand, he gave up the fight and died. But two of the cowboys tied the ropes together and threw them to the boy and yelled for him to tie it on the saddle horn, cut the saddle free, and hang on to the saddle. He did so, and they pulled him out, saddle, bridle, and all, except the pony. He went down the river. Uh, this young boy, of course, shouldn't even have been there. He was by himself, no family, scared, crying. They all held a consultation, decided to do what they could to help him. They were on a little bench, as he termed it, the river bank, and had a good view of the promised land. They suggested the boy stay right where he was, stake out a claim. Everyone had taken a small flag. I don't know if this was a flag given to people crossing into the property, but you staked this flag and that was your property. That's the way you held it, theoretically. They all ga He gave him his flag and told him to stick it into the ground, put the saddle on it, and stay right there. I gave him some matches and a leg of jerky venison and told him somebody would come back and help him. He did come back that way two or three days later and the boy was still there, so uh, he, he apparently stayed. He was one of those who came for uh, who knows where. I left and rode up to the top of a small elevation and had a front view in the great amphitheater of the world's greatest run for land in the United States. The sight was inspiring, novel, and wicked. Everyone for himself and damn the other fellow. A vain, selfish humanity in a beautiful land. I sat on my horse and saw hundreds and thousands riding for that home they had thought about out in, Cal in Oklahoma. Ooh, don't know how I got California in there. He always wanted to go, but he never made it. <laughs> 
I did. <laughs> Women, children, and all were in that crazy rush for land. Wagons, buggies, buckboards, wheelbarrows, push carts, and footmen, all in a jumble. A horse would fall, a wheel or a wagon there, a wheel would come off, or a pony step into a badger hole, break his leg. The owner would have to stop and shoot the horse, take saddle and bridle, or st and stop and stake his flag. No one stopped to help anyone, man or woman. It was root, hog, or die. Every minute or so, a fellow would come by, shoot off his gun, and stick in his flag. He had located his claim, and this meant keep off. I saw a light wagon upset and throw the entire family out and all its contents, but the man wasn't hurt. He ran back, picked up the children, helped the woman to her feet, stuck in his flag, and started camping. I rode slowly on, going north by now. He never really liked crowds, so perhaps this is why he went so far that day. The mass of the riders had gone on, some stopping and firing off their guns and sticking up their flags. Some had no flags, so they'd use a red bandana or take a shirt tail and stick it on a bush or a rosin tree, all looking for, or they'd look for a stone that would mark the property off into sections. Every settler looked wild and woolly and would shout at the least provocation. And uh, he speaks about riding up. And uh, he speaks about riding up to one man to ask if he had found any cornerstones or other marks because he thought, well, if there weren't any, he'd stop there. But when I got within 300 feet of him, he got to his horse and shouted, go on, don't get any nearer you are, you son of a... I didn't like his Sunday school talk. So, and I wanted to get farther away from acquaintances of his kind. He looked half wild and I knew he could shoot a squirrel's eye out a long way off. So I controlled my temper and moved on. Uh, as to a description of the prop of the land, there were deer, antelope, plenty of jackrabbits, a head of that racing army. I had lots of good chances to kill an antelope or wild turkey, but what would I do with it? I had jerky enough to last for three days, and I never enjoyed killing for sport. About sundown, I arrived at Kingfisher, another crazy, milling, stinking mass of excited humanity. I envied my beaver friends, where all was clean and friendly. People poured into that mob all night. I staked out some lots by moonlight and found them mostly in the middle of the street, according to the survey of the town later. One of my lots was located on the creek bank, a stinking little dribble full of sulfur, and the water was gypsum. It was like taking a dose of castor oil. Some wise guy had brought a tank of fair water and was selling it at five cents a drink or ten cup full. I took a dime's worth. We held a mass meeting at six o'clock, elected a mayor and city marshal, city clerk, and secretary. About a hundred fellows wanted to talk at once, but didn't succeed very well. Most of them said, I'm from Texas, and that seemed to be all the credentials they needed. We were all finally disgusted with the Texans. At last, one man had the courage to say, I'm from Kansas, and then acted as if he would like to dodge behind a wagon. All Texas was Democratic at that time, and Kansas was Republican but northern Oklahoma was populated mostly by northern men who were Republican too, so we elected that man mayor. There were soldiers all around the camp and uh, they came in to try to keep people from taking property away from others and stealing and so forth because it was pretty rough. I took my horse and gun, got my best lot and staked him on it. I used my bob skin, bobcat skin for a bed and my saddle blanket for a cover and lay down to rest but nicks for sleep in that mob. I don't think anyone slept that much that much that night was shooting in the air and shouting all night. When I woke up the next morning, I took a dry buffalo chip from under my bed and started a small fire. I had a coffee pot tied to my saddle and it made, got it down, made me a strong concoction, concoction and called it coffee. But it was like Mark Twain said about coffee. It was jippy water. There was plenty of venison so I had a good breakfast, short on vitamins but long on proteins. I had to carry my Winchester because some guy would snatch it if I didn't. And uh, I was afraid some of the Dalton boys might come around and take care of the bank, so I didn't put my money in that. And the bank was robbed about two weeks later by four men in daylight, supposed to be the Dalton boys. 
They just stepped in regardless of the soldiers and were gone on their fine horses before the soldiers could get saddled up because nobody would interfere with them. Actually, he let it go uh, because I think he did it just for the excitement and the fun of it. And he didn't keep it. He did uh, later try to, uh, to um, take some property west of Chickasha in this area uh, by going out and staying on the land. I believe it was uh, six months out of the year he could prove his title, but he gave that up too. He wasn't really much on uh, staying out in the rough areas for very long at a time. He liked his civilization, <laughs> so he didn't retain any property in that area. And uh, as he said, most of it, it turned out to be in the middle, on the main street of Kingfisher anyway, so it wouldn't have been any good to him. He sold, well, here we are. I sold one lot for $150 and left that same day, <laughs> so he went for the excitement. The sale of the lot paid for the ex expedition of the run into Oklahoma. I didn't want any more of it. I was hungry for civilization. He went back down to the Canadian, and the young boy was still there, whom they had seen at the time of the run. And uh, he, t he uh, gave the boy $10 and told him to go get some food because he said he didn't have any money. So I told him I wasn't running an orphanage, but I couldn't let him starve or freeze. So I gave him the 10 bucks and told him to get a slab of bacon, some beans, a sack of meal, salt, coffee, and a spade. And he came back well loaded. He got a spade and matches and candles. Those weren't on his order, but uh, I had forgotten them, and I decided he was quite bright, so it was worthwhile. He also helped the boy build a sod house. I thought it interesting. I didn't know exactly how you built a sod house. But I knew it was up to him to survive or, or perish, so I helped him. We started a Sadie, S-A-D-I-E, as the nesters called them. I marked off a foundation about eight to 10 feet and showed him how to lay the sods outside a little lower than the inside by laying a stick of cane or reed to make the slant of the sod. One side was five feet, the other four and then he dug out the center and roofed it over with reeds and grass. I found some gumbo mud that was as good as plaster to stop up the holes and cracks in the sod. That's the way I had seen some good Indians and Mexican jackals do it in the absence of wood. We had a fine dinner of belly, I guess he means sow belly, corn cakes and coffee, <laughs> thinking I could make Purcell that day. Now this is all in one day. I left him with tears in his eyes. I gave him my coffee pot and canteen, which held half a gallon, my saddle, blanket, hunting knife, and the rest of my turkey venison. As I, turkey venison? That's what he says. <laughs> As I had expected to be home by sundown. I've often thought of that green kid and wondered how he came out. After that, apparently, because Purcell had been a town where people were building up to go into the run, uh, Purcell became uh, very poor. Everything, uh, uh, everyone, he says, met me with a long face. They were all idle. The tidal wave of deflation had submerged Purcell, and it never did return to, to prosperity. And as uh, he was writing this in 1941, said, to this day it is a deserted village. I don't know how Purcell would feel about that. <laughs> They then went over to Lexington across the river, and uh, he stayed there for a time. It was a fine piece of land with a creek running through the center and timbered with pecan trees and live oaks. I could shoot turkeys from the porch, and I gathered several bushels of nuts. There's much in here about uh, the countryside. He tells some good stories about um, well, he next decided that he'd go over to uh, the Oklahoma Territory and went up to Aaron Springs. Would this be of interest to you? Um, he had been treating patients, of course, uh, as a doctor, and he, he always told the story that he could treat anything with a gallon of whiskey and a gallon of uh, quinine, and I think he did. I'm afraid he did everything that way. He did have some surgical instruments, but very few. Um, when I landed at the crossroads known as Aaron Springs, I had not improved my association with the primitive. 
All the big cow men who had married into the Indian tribes had most of their wives' relatives to support, and they were surely primitive. They lived in teepees and wickiups. They did their laundering at the river bank, pounding the clothes with paddles. They made their own soft soap by saving all meat fat, and put their wood ashes into an ash hopper made of strips of bark placed in frames of wood made into a sort of funnel, like a V, with an iron pot beneath to catch the drip of lye. The Indian women would empty the ashes they had saved into the hopper and pour some water on it. When they had gathered a sufficient quantity, ten gallons or more, they would put it in the scraps of fat meat in a big iron kettle, set it over a fire, and boil it for a long time until it became thick. It was used as a toilet article as well as for washing clothes. It would surely take off the dirt, and the skin too, if you didn't watch out. I never used it on my face, but it was fine to disinfect surgical instruments. Their corn was ground by a water mill. We had a good one on Rush Creek. The head or source of the creek was 40 miles west of what is now Rush Springs in, on the Rock Island Railroad south of Chickasha. The ranchers would give the Indians a steer for barbecue. They cooked the steer over a bed of coals in a pit they dug. It was sure fine meat, and if well cooked, delicious. They didn't use any salt, as they claimed it made them drink so much water that they had no room for the meat, some philosophy in that. At that time, the chickens, turkeys, guineas, and hogs ran wild and picked up their own living. When anyone wanted one to eat, he'd shoot what he wanted. Consequently, the fowl and hogs were as wild as deer. When they wanted eggs, the kids would go into the woods and find them. There were no straw stacks or haystacks. The cattle ran all winter on winter range. I loved the romantic old country, its trees, animals, creeks, and all, and there was plenty of water to drink. One called Branch Creek consisted of a hole in a little stream or a spring. There were all kinds of sunfish and catfish in all the little clear water streams and I have caught some fine bass on top of some of the highest ridges, and now they're gone. He names over the creeks, Rush Creek, Fish Creek, Soldier Creek, Mud Creek, Stinking Creek, and Mustang. They all emptied into the Washita and the Little Washita. There were no bridges. When I came to a stream, I forded it if it was deep. I'd get up on my knees in the saddle and not get my feet wet. The poorer people were just as primitive as their surroundings. All those valleys were populated by small farmers who rented farms on shares and having no taxes did much better than after the statehood. There were some very poor people there. Uh, one little boy came in one day to him. And he knew the child was poor from the way he looked, but he was, and he was crying, but he insisted upon talking with him. And uh, it seemed that he had a note from his mother, Dear Doctor, I'm all alone and I'm going to have a baby. Please come quickly. She gave her name and said she was on Bitter Creek 10 miles south. So he took the boy and uh, they got on the horse. He gave the boy a quarter and told him to go get something to eat. Said his joyous lo look was great compensation for the two bits. I knew they were very poor. So uh, I went to the store and bought a pound cache of coffee, sugar, some canned peaches and crackers, got up on my jack and lit up the creek. I found my patient very bad and all alone. Her husband had gone into Purcell. There was one bed, a small table, and two nail kegs for chairs in a one-room shanty. I asked her for clean sheets, but they had none. I did the best I could for the poor woman, and at 3 p.m. delivered her child. There was no woman within four miles, so I washed and dressed the little devil and handed it to her. The little boy told her what a fine dinner he had had with his quarter. He bought two cans of sardines. He was a happy boy. She told me that she'd have to, to have credit for the baby, and I told her that was fine. So she kissed me, and I left. That's all I was ever paid, as the man was no good, but she was a fine press agent. I had calls to within 10 miles of Purcell and Paul's Valley, thanks to these press agents. Because of these people, as he said, his press agents, he did, and uh, did he, he had his uh, his wife and daughter had come down, and they lived there for a time, but uh, 
he began to realize that the country was becoming too well populated and again he was uh, a man for adventure so uh, he, and he had also begun to build up too much property he was a man who didn't care to own a lot of things he describes uh, having eight head of ponies in the corral because when people couldn't pay him they'd give him a pony or they'd uh, he also had uh, a lot of hay and uh, he was uh, paid in some gold uh, he would get cotton he had a lot of cotton he had corn stacked up he had several saddles and he realized he was becoming overcome with property again so he became anxious to move on uh, yes I thought we'd get over here let's see well after there I'm sorry uh, from Aaron Springs then um, it uh, I would like to uh, I can find it here describe the uh, home of Frank Murray one of the very early people at Aaron Springs it was a fine big home and I believe his uh, wife was an Indian and they had much property there let me see if we can find that uh, Want me to pause it while you're looking? the home that Murray had built after he married an Indian wife and uh, subsequently came into a lot of property and many people to support was a great is a great stone house uh, it is there today and I believe the Oklahoma State Historical Society has it under control it has three stories and the top floor is given over to a huge ballroom uh, it was a beautiful home uh, built with uh, oh, Italian marble and many fine furnishings and uh, was quite a sight to see in that time since then uh, Aaron Springs has uh, uh, deteriorated to no town at all but there the cemetery there is filled with uh, many prominent people of that era including some bad men uh, the railroad I decided was a thing that would determine where the best towns would be so when the uh, Santa Fe Railroad I believe it was came into Oklahoma uh, they established a location called Pensy across the uh, Canadian River from uh, Chickasha so I went to Pensy Pensy did not become a city, but Chickasha became a town. So I then moved on to Chickasha. One of the funniest stories, we think, uh, when he moved to Chickasha, he moved into the top part of an old store building and had his family come over. And uh, they lived up uh, over the store and uh, as well as his practicing medicine. And the first uh, one of the first dentists, Dr. T. H. Williams, uh, also officed in that area. And uh, one day a huge Negro man came in who had a bad tooth. He was obviously uncomfortable and something had to be done about the bad tooth. So Dr. Williams was out somewhere and Dr. Johnston didn't think he'd be back very soon. So he decided to pull the man's tooth for him. He put him in the old chair there but uh, he had to hold him down practically because he had nothing to use for anesthesia and the man was nervous anyway and kept thrashing around and uh, there was a little dog who stayed up in the offices there just a small dog who was kind of a friend of the two doctors and the little dog could hear the man groaning and grunting and could hear Dr. Johnson probably cursing him making him be quiet the little dog started barking and the man got excited and the whole crew the dog and the doctor and the man all ended up on the floor but they got that tooth out and the, the Negro man said, Doc, I'll come back maybe, but I don't want no dog pulling any more teeth for me. <laughs> Which we thought was a good story about that. Uh, he went out one time, too, in Chickasha to uh, treat some people, some nesters, as he called them, old nesters out in the country. And uh, the man said, Doc, I don't, I don't have no way to pay you nothing, but I'll, I'll give you something if you'll keep quiet about it. And he said, well, what do you mean, give me something? So he gave him a gallon of whiskey. He said, where did you get that? Because there wasn't supposed to be any uh, whiskey in the area at all. And he said, well, if you won't tell, I'll show you. And he lifted up the 
bedspread, and there under the bed was a, a small still. He was making it right under the bed while the, <laughs> while the doctor was delivering a baby on top of the bed. <laughs> so he kept quiet about it and took the whiskey. <laughs> he uh, describes, too, something that our mother, his daughter, uh, told us about when we were children about pets, and I thought the difference in the times uh, that he uh, came across a little coon one evening, and he brought it home. And he said, I got some baby bottles, nipples, milk, and my wife and my baby, uh, baby girl Blanche now had a, had a uh, pet. The raccoon is the cutest little devil you ever saw. I fed them on milk alone until uh, the raccoons could eat solid food. They liked uh, their food raw, but they washed all their solid food before they would eat it. I got them a crock of water, and it was fun to watch them do their washings. Chickasha was pretty lively, too, as far as uh, thieves and uh, bad men. And he tells about one evening, once a bunch of us were going up to the store to a poker game and to get the news. We turned the corner of a warehouse adjoining the store and saw a column of six horsemen passing in front of us. It was just light enough for us to see them all in line with fine horses. And uh, I asked an Indian <coughs> in front of me who it was, and he said, Indian police. And I said, Nix, those are highwaymen. We dropped to the ground, and somebody said, let's shoot them up a little. We emptied our guns over their heads and slid behind the house. The highwaymen went into a huddle for a few minutes, then they mounted their horses and started away. After going about 100 feet, they stopped and gave us their salute of six guns. Then at a gallop, they retreated. The bullets struck all around us and above us and under us, but never struck any of us. We expected a battle, but we retreated for safety. I rushed home, told my wife and Blanche to get behind my stack of heavy books and put out the light, gathered up three Winchesters, two boxes of cartridges, and slipped back to the boys behind the, the stone wall. We let go one salvo and listened. We could hear their horses down the road. We were sure they were gone, so we went to the big store and found a clerk. The clerk said, boys, you're a bunch of fools, you, but you saved the robbery of the store and a loss of thousands of dollars. He had sold a bunch of cotton that day and actually had some money in the uh, place. And uh, he said he sure was interested because he'd sold 17 bales to the store that s himself that morning. They'd have, they would have made a haul of about $13,000 if they'd gone into the store. It was um, <coughs> downtown along, uh, well, the main street of Chickasha is the same as it was then. I can remember that they said there were board walks because it was just mud. There was no paving, of course, and they had to step up to get onto the board walks. And then this little building was a two-story frame building, uh, which later burned. And it burned many of his relics. And maybe his bobcat was there. I don't know. His bobcat skin might have been. Um, one thing that, that uh, my sister and I relate to that period, uh, our grandmother had brought with her from Iowa when they first went to Purcell and then to Aaron Springs and then to Chickasha, uh, a begonia plant. And since they lived upstairs over the store, which was common in those days, she kept her begonia plants along on the windowsill to get the sunshine. And one day one of them fell out and the plant split up into various pieces she knew she couldn't make it grow again, so she gave the little starts, as she would call them, to some of her friends. And we, we say that the uh, business that, we, that she, gra she established at that time, which was a florist shop and a growing place for greenhouse, started from that begonia plant. That was always her history of it. And they, their first little greenhouse, their first little business, along with his being a doctor, was started at that time uh, in a dugout with a bit of glass up over the top. And uh, we do have pictures of her standing in this area. You had to walk down about five steps, and there she would be in her little greenhouse. She actually shipped flowers from uh, Kansas City, I believe, in the early days by the train. And of course, the trains uh, made many more stops, and they, were, they covered more territory in those days. So you could do this. But uh, she started that business, and that business is still in existence with the third generation running it, so we're proud of that. But that begonia plant was the start of all that. <laughs> he, um, he continued to be a doctor for many years and uh, kept up his mind 
by reading the medical journals. We were fortunate in that a good friend, uh, Dr. Alex Leeds, one of the early doctors here, would come to see him nearly every day, even when my grandfather was in his 80s and early 90s. He would come to see Dr. Johnston and bring him the medical journals, and they would discuss medicine and the advances. And even though he didn't practice those last perhaps 30 or 40 years, he could describe all the latest uh, of medical fields, and this helped him to keep his mind very sharp and bright. I still have a few of his small instruments. I even have one tiny vial of pills. I don't know what it is, something <laughs> very important, I'm sure. But he always felt that he was still prepared, if necessary, to be a doctor. And uh, we admired him for keeping his mind uh, so bright. This concludes a very interesting interview with the two Miss Dews uh, on their grandfather, Dr. Johnson. They would bring up uh, barrels.